Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1819. 1819, what happened in 1819? Hmm. As I recall, there was a panic in 1819. It was the first major financial crisis in the United States. History repeating itself, of course, over and over again. At any rate, be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. I'm back across the pond today, a place I love to go in the UK with a very special guest by the name of Ben Guinan. Hey, Ben, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have it in gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? I certainly am, Mark. Great to be here. Well, thank you. We're going to have some fun today. Now, before I give you a proper English introduction, would you share one little thing with us that maybe most people don't know about you? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Well, I am um, a big fan of, of Star Wars and um, George Lucas is one of my heroes. And I actually met him once and I insulted him oh. by telling him his movies. This was this reference to the to the, the um, when he remade part one, two, when he launched part one, two and three. And I insulted him by telling them I thought they were too busy and too much full of full of too much CGI. <laughs> and, and what was his response? Dare I well, ask? It, <laughs> He, he, he sort of he, he nodded politely while I was talking and then just turned back away from me to carry on the conversation having with someone else <laughs> on the other side of the room. So I, but at that point, I knew that was my time to exit and leave the space I was in. Yeah, I'm imagining in his head, oh, another expert telling me how to do my job. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> oh, the world's full of critics, that's for sure. But uh, that's that's pretty funny. Yeah, those, it's one of those situations when you meet somebody famous like that. And as you're telling them or, or saying something to them, part of you is saying, Stop talking. <laughs> Be quiet. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it, yeah, it was um, it was a, um, a I was asked a question by somebody else and I was kind of responding to that question, but didn't realize that he was in earshot. He turned and sort of joined the conversation. Ah. And, and as you say, you sort of realize yourself inside your mind is saying, just stop talking because George is listening. You know? Yeah. You know, I got to uh, sit in on this new app Clubhouse that's out there now. And I got to sit in on a, it was a Saturday evening on a very cool room chat where Elon Musk called in and I got in just by luck because the room filled up literally in about 10 seconds of 5,000 listeners and he was talking about Tesla they're asking him questions and then they had Vlad who is the guy that uh, is in charge of Robin Hood and it was right after that big Robin Hood issue where uh, they you know a group of people went in and took care of uh, GameStop and basically drove the stocks up and lost a lot of money for people. And, and it was very fascinating because the first thing Elon said to Vlad, these are two billionaires talking and you're sitting there listening to these guys. And he said, what were you thinking? Why'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and then it went on and it was just, I'm sitting here going, wow, this is a kind of a little insider story, but I loved his bluntness. And uh, of course, we all know where that all has moved on to and who knows where it'll all end up. But uh, of course, yeah, sometimes yeah. it's kind of fun. Well, let me give you a proper introduction. Ben Guinan is the sales director and spearheading the launch of a new international Concorde Elegance event titled Auto Royale that takes place this July in the United Kingdom at the former Rothschilds family home of Watteson Manor. Sounds like a nice little place. It's fantastic. I'll bet, yeah. With a background in media and publishing, Ben has 25 years experience managing international brands, partnerships, events, and leading the commercial business for some of the most recognized magazines and websites in the motorsport and classic motorsporting markets, including Autosport, The Autosport Show, F1 Racing, Classic and Sports Car, to name just a few. Ben feels very privileged to have spent eight years in international motorsports. He spent 11 years in classic and historic motoring, which was a great alignment with his enthusiasm for all things automotive, where his love of cars and the spirit behind their ownership came to fore. We'll be back in just a minute, but first a word from our valued sponsors, so give them a listen and we'll be right back. Keep the seatbelts on. Did you know the most damaging thing to your vehicle's interior is the sun? Harsh UV rays damage your interior over time, cracking the dash, fading colors, and the heat 
makes getting into your favorite ride downright unbearable. My friends at Covercraft have the perfect solution for you and me. Their quality-made sunscreens are easy to use, take seconds to install and to remove, and they protect your vehicles while parked in the sun if using a cover isn't a good option. I have one for every one of my cars. They come in a variety of colors and options, and their accordion design makes unfolding and folding them up for storage as cool as the summer breeze. Your sunscreen comes custom-tailored for your special vehicles and manufactured with the quality and attention to detail that's been the standard for Covercraft since 1965. Here at Cars Yeah, I've got a savings just for you. Use the code ya 21 that's Y-E-A-H, Two one at Covercraft.com and they'll give you 10% off your Covercraft order. That's right, 10% off. Simply use the code ya 21 at checkout. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. When it was time to renew my collector car policy, my carrier raised my rates by a lot. But why? My usage was the same, my car's value was the same, and I had never made a claim. I didn't even have a ticket. The only change was their rate, and they had no reason why. What's with that? I researched my options, I spoke to others, and with American Collectors Insurance is where I now have my policy. What a difference. A live person actually answers the phone. She spent time learning about me and my Porsche Turbo, the one I call my orange crush, and provided a reasonable quote. American Collectors Insurance now protects my special ride. I'm saving hundreds of dollars and I can sleep at night knowing my baby is properly insured. Why wait until your next premium is due? Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote. Call 866-AC1-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of mine. Mark Green at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. Automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. That's American Collectors Insurance. If you're if you're interested, Mark, I have a um, a, another interesting fact about me that most people don't know. And and given that I imagine that a lot of your audience are probably based in the US and following you avidly, um, uh, I used to I actually used to play American football. Really? American football? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big NFL fan. I follow the Packers, have done since I was very young, since the, the late 80s. And uh, when I was a, at school, I guess high school, you'd call it, I, I was playing rugby, yeah. uh, as you do in Britain. And uh, I got into American football and I played for four or five years uh, for a team locally where I grew up. Uh, I was on the defense. I played corner uh, for about four and a half seasons. Yeah. A Brit that plays NFL. There you go. Well, not NFL, but but, uh, but football. There we go. Yeah, now there's a first. Of uh, course, yeah. <laughs> I find that. <laughs> that's really fascinating. Cool. I played some football in high school. I was a wide receiver. Yeah. Oh, I, was think, I think I was put there not because I was tall, because I was fast. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could run out really quick. But I quick. was the same thing. But I just wanted to hit rather than be hit. Uh, I, I oh. wanted to uh, have the Okay, well, you and I were kind of the opposites. I hated getting hit. I didn't like that at all. I didn't like hitting people. I just like catching the ball and running for a touchdown. I'm being the hero. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> why not? Well, let's uh, dive a little deeper into the corner uh, with what you're doing there with this new event. I'd love for you to talk more about what the event's all about, what people could expect to experience, and uh, this incredible setting that this is going to take place. So take it away. Well, it's designed to bring something fresh to the UK event scene. I mean, essentially, this this is an idea that started with a collector, an individual that um, is very well known in Concord circles around the world, having been and shown cars at some of the major events, the Pebble Beach Concours, Amelia Island, and, and, and others like that, Villa d'Este in Italy. And this collector believed that that level of Concours, that standard, that quality, wasn't being represented very well in the UK. There were some great events. There are some fantastic events in the UK. But he believed there was a there was a gap. And you know, my the business, my background, and, and together with my business colleague, who has a wealth of experience in the international concour world, having run an event overseas in Australia for for a decade as event director, we were offered this opportunity um, with his support to to create something different, something that would would elevate the concour scene in the UK onto that international level. So we've um, we've put together what we feel is is quite an interesting approach. It, it, while it does have the familiar 
uh, elements of, of an international conquer in terms of its um, its traditional classes and and the kind of cars it, it's attracting within those classes. Uh, it does aim to deliver the event in a very different way. It, it's looking to be breaking down the stereotypes that you would expect. There's a very much a a vision that you have in your mind when someone talks about a Concorde d'Elegance event, you, you instantly imagine the setting and the style, and 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 we're trying to break down those preconceptions by how we want to deliver the event, and that will go through all the way from um, the creative tone and the themes we we bring in, into presenting the event itself, all the way through to the immersive nature and the innovation that we're bringing into into the show for everyone to it to to uh, benefit from, not just the the brand and our partners that are coming to join us but also from, importantly, the entrance themselves, our guests for the weekend, and all, and those visitors coming to enjoy their time. You know, So we're hosting it, as you said, Mark, at, at Wadston Manor, which is a, an absolutely sensational place uh, in Buckinghamshire in the UK. As you said correctly, a former home of the Rothschild dynasty. In fact, the first home that was built by Lord Rothschild back in the 1870s. Wow. He, at the time, was obsessed with French Renaissance architecture. So he brought across from France an architect to design and build his house. So to give you an idea of what this thing looks like, if you can imagine a, a rather large and rather impressive French Renaissance chateau in the middle of Britain, that's what Wadston Manor is. It's an absolute sensation. Yeah, when you Google that, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 yeah, first I thought, wait, is that We're the Palace lucky. of Versailles or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we are we are very, very fortunate. I mean, you know, the, the, the team at Watson are fantastic. Um, they're very much enthusiastic about what we're doing. We, we couldn't ask for a better venue partner. They are absolutely fabulous. Now, will the event be, uh, it looks like in the nice little backyard there on the lawn. Is that, <laughs> is that where, is that where that will take, now I see the gardens are, yeah, yeah the, in the, the front. The, the, the Concord cars will be presented on the lawns nice. um, with the house, but, but the, in terms of the 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 wider experience, whether you're looking for the entertainment, the food, the the champagne, the hospitality, that's going to be sort of uh, uh, spread around the, the 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 main grounds. And we we are looking to design some kind of journey. So once you've enjoyed your time looking at these sensational cars on the lawn, you can then go off and and explore those grounds at Wadston and discover more and more about Autoreal as you as you delve deeper into the event itself. And that's a, a, a facility that people can visit anyway, I believe, right? Is it a place where people can go and, and visit? And, yeah. yeah, yeah, the venue, yes, you're right. But it's it's actually part of the National Trust, mm. um, which is uh, obviously a charitable um, body. And, and so you can access this um, this venue at any time. You know, you, if you're a member of the National Trust, you, you get access uh, for free as part of your annual membership, but it, but you can equally buy tickets uh, as, as a day visitor to go and see it. One important thing that we've we've managed to be able to do with Watson is that they are the family still have an involvement with the, the 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 venue, and they are able to run private events from time to time. And we are very fortunate that the weekend of Auto Royale will be on one of those private weekends. So so on that occasion, it's a closed event just for us, our visitors, and our guests. But any other time of the year, Mark, absolutely, you can you can go there, you can enjoy the gardens you can enjoy the house and have a fabulous time well i can't imagine a better to opportunity to enjoy that location and that magnificent palace if you will with cars added to it that makes well, me very well. excited and <laughs> and i want to do a shout out thank you to uh paul mathers he's a past guest here who introduced me to ben you can go back and find his show on the cars yeah website yeah if anybody is leading the charge uh, who knows what he's doing in this venue uh it would be paul so i think it's fantastic and paul thank you for introducing me uh to ben today it's been absolutely fantastic can you give us some idea of the type of vehicles that we can see when we attend well, yeah. I mean, we've we've um, we've recently uh, confirmed the 100 cars that would be joining us for that event. I mean, it, it's 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 a process. It, it's it's slightly different to other events in the UK, whereas we have a curation team that make a selection from all the entries that came in for the event, and we had a significant number of entries, and we whittled that down to a short list of of 100 cars, and they have been invited to join us. But you know, these cars will range from um, sort of vintage and veteran through to the pre-war classics into post-war classics and then into the the more sort of uh, traditional sort of 50s, 60s, sort of more the more uh, contemporary classics that we would be perhaps more familiar with in, in those respects. I see. 
Very cool. Well, it sounds absolutely fantastic. I'd like to ask you a little bit about your career and your path because you've been so involved in uh, the automotive world for so long. When did you realize that's the career path that you wanted to go down? Well, I, 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 uh, I kind of fell into it really by accident. I mean, I, I, I finished college and, and, and got my results and, and, and most people then think, what am I going to do? And I was offered a, a job at a, at a publishing company back in the 90s. So I'm, I'm a pre-internet guy, uh, you know, working just Me with a telephone. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, nice. yeah, great. Just working with a telephone, uh, a set of business cards, and, and, and off we go sort of selling advertising space in business magazines. That's where I started. I did that for a few years, about, about seven or eight years in total time. And during that time, I rose from being just a junior executive up to a, a group commercial manager on a, on, a, on a range of products. And at that point, this was, this was around the early 2000s, I was offered an opportunity by a colleague of mine to move into the other half of the company, the publishing company that I was working with at the time, to work on a new launch of a product, which was a, a magazine that was to, designed to serve the World Rally Championship audience. Because we had the company already had a number of Formula One products and, and other motorsport products, but they had nothing specific for world rally the uh the the media rights owner of world rally a gentleman called david richards wanted to have something similar to what f1 had with their own product their own dedicated magazine so my my company got the contract they were launching this product and i joined the team as as then commercial manager and it kind of started there so and as a car guy you know you couldn't i mean i wasn't really a world rally enthusiast per se but as a car guy i mean what more do you want you know you just want to get involved with the market to get out to talk about cars and oh, yeah. see cars and, and meet the automotive brands and meet the partners and and my role was very much front of house. My, my job is going to sound terribly glamorous, but my job was to travel to all the rallies and to, <laughs> nice. to, to build the relationship, the commercial relationships with the the teams, the manufacturers and, and their sponsors that were operating the World Rally Championship at that time. So I started there. And after a, a year or two, uh, I was offered the, I guess you could say the promotion to move up into Formula One. And I was offered, uh, asked to do the same job but in the F1 space. Wow. And uh, again, it sounds terribly glamorous on paper. I had to travel to every Grand Prix. Uh, I worked out of the um, the paddock, the real inner sanctum of, yeah, of Formula yeah. One. Wow. And again, my, my clients were all of the F1 teams, uh, their partners, the stakeholders, the FIA themselves, and so on. And, and really just building the commercial relationships for a product called F1 Racing. Uh, at the time, which was like the official recognized Formula One magazine for, for the yeah. sport. Yeah, sounds terribly boring. I don't know how you <laughs> dealt with that, but uh, yeah. you, you also did a bunch with MotoGP too, right? I did. That's right. Yeah, well, that, that came a little bit later. Um, and, and that was um, uh, that was a really interesting time for me. It, literally only a couple of years, a relatively short time compared to my Formula One and my World Rally time. But it was really interesting. I'm, I'm not a biker. My brother and my father, my late father, uh, were were bikers. Well, he's my brother still is a biker, and I went down the car route. My 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 father liked cars and bikes together, so it was quite interesting to go into that that, that sphere because I would really had a very limited amount of knowledge, but I found it absolutely fascinating because we're you know if you're passionate about cars and machinery and speed and excitement, I mean these things are just crazy. And, and the guys that ride them, the guys and girls that ride them, I mean, they are absolute heroes because these things are are serious weapons on the racetrack. You know, when I watch MotoGP or events like Isle of Man and they do the super slow-mo shots, I just sit there on the edge of my seat and the anxiety level builds in my body. <laughs> I, I rode motorcycles for a while and I just go, how do those people do that? I don't know. It's, I it's don't know. beyond... Uh, I can't even imagine. I spent a little bit of time. I had an Envy Augusta F4 for a while, which was crazy right. for me to have. But yep. I, I got to take yep. it on the track a little bit and, and ride it. Now, nowhere near what they do, but just realizing, going, how do those guys do that? <laughs> it's incredible. Well, I, I tell you, Mark, I, I, one of one of my favorite experiences from that time, and I, I met some great people. I, I really got to appreciate what this was about because the racing is probably the closest and most exciting racing you'll ever watch, as as indeed you know yep. from watching this yourself. But one of my best experiences in in my time in MotoGP, I was invited to to a corporate day from a sponsor I was working with to experience the two-seater MotoGP bike. 
What a two seater! I've ne- I've heard two-seater. of I've t- heard of two seater uh, Indy cars, Formula One yeah. cars. I've even yeah. seen a three seater Formula One Ferrari at the factory. Yeah. But a two seater bike? It's a two seater bike. It's a specially modified frame. It was based on a Ducati. It had a slightly stretched frame, obviously reinforced to cap- cater for the extra weight. And you were riding pillion behind a rider. Oh my god. Now I'm not a biker, so yeah, and if you guys are and many of your listeners might be as well. Oh, so yeah. I was introduced to my pilot for the day who I'd never heard of, so I was just treating him as a, as the respect he deserved because he's a, he's a semi he's a former professional MotoGP rider and you might have heard of him. His name is Randy Mamola. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, being the sort of the, the gormless Brit in the room, you know, not knowing much about MotoGP, I thought, oh, ben, this is Randy. Oh, hi, Randy. How are you? You know, it's nice to meet you. And when I told my friends later, they said, you're kidding me. You, <laughs> you went on a bike with Randy Mamola? I mean, crikey, the guy's incredible. So, yeah, it, it was uh, it was quite an experience, Mark. I mean, it, you know, it was um, I've been in race cars and, and I'm sure you have as well. And if any one of your listeners have done the same thing, you know, it's quite an experience. I mean, and the biggest thing you always take away from these experiences, apart from the consummate skill of the driver or rider in question, but the thing you always take away is the braking. It's not the acceleration. It's not even the corner speed. It's the, the fear, ferocity of the braking. So I was expecting the bike to be quite, you know, not as not as sharp. It's a bike. It's only got two wheels and little bits of rubber on it. And we're going to brake way in advance of the corner. But of course, that wasn't the case. No. This thing, these things are incredible. And um, having seen, as you say, having seen the guy operate the bike at what I thought was was um, warp speed uh, around the, the circuit we were on, uh, you know, unbelievable how they get to do or how they do what they do with these machines because it was quite an experience for me. I'm not sure I could do that. <laughs> it sounds wonderful, but I have a hard time getting in a race car with someone else driving because the right. uh, the two times I've been a passenger to a race car, the driver crashed. So, uh, oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, once we went upside yeah. down and the car ended up on the roof. So, uh, okay. yeah, so I, I kind of stay out of the right seat, at least on this side right. of the pond, oh. uh, in a yeah. race car. But uh, you'll like this, Ben. The uh, the two v- British cars I've owned in my life were both vintage race cars that I raced. One was a Lotus 18 uh-huh. Formula Junior, of course, the first open wheel sure. car Jimmy Clark drove. Yeah. Right. And uh, right. the other was a Lola T290 Sports Racer. So, uh, there you oh, go. Okay. Yeah. Good cars. Had great Good cars. cars. But uh, bikes, yeah. yeah, that's a whole nother deal. Let, let's talk a little bit about a driving inspiration in your life, Ben. Uh, who has that key mentor been for you? Someone that really pushed you, helped you move along in your career? And uh, how did they do that? Yeah, it is one of the questions that um, I gave a lot of thought to this because, as with anyone, there's always a number of factors, a number of people that influence you through your life and your career. I mean, I, you know, without wishing to sound um, a bit obvious, and my, my my late father was certainly one of those. But in business terms, I, I, there there are two people actually. One of them was a gentleman I used to work with in my Formula One days. He was actually my boss at the time, and I worked very closely with him for for several years. And and he was a uh, an incredible commercial uh, person, you know, fabulous at the networking side of things and, and and very much a creative thinker when it comes to the solutions that we were looking to to sell to uh, to the uh, the Formula One partners and brands and what have you. Um, and, and I took a lot of lot from him and his his approach to to the creative side of selling his strong work ethics, his focus on on the client being first, you know, making sure that we deliver exactly on the client's KPIs. Um, but 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 and, but also, and I think this is the important bit for me really, is to enjoy what you're doing. I mean, he he absolutely loved what he did, um, and and I think you know, in, in many things, in whatever you do, you've got to have or got to be able to find some level of enthusiasm and passion, no matter if you're someone that um, is working on a construction side or whether you're working in banking or, as we do, working around cars and automotive, you, you've got to find the passion uh, and to enjoy that. And it just it just improves things for you. So that was one big influence for me on, on, the, uh, on the commercial and side of was, things. And what was his gentleman's name? Uh, his name is Ian Burrows. Ah, okay. Yeah, and, and he and I worked together for many years uh, in, in the publishing world. And I still think he, I, I haven't spoken to him for a while, but and I believe he still does work within sort of international motorsport and Formula One, but doing some other things now. But 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 very inspirational for me. Yeah, really good guy. Very cool. Now, if you were going to advise other people to go into a career path like you've had, maybe what's a, <laughs> maybe what's a word of wisdom you might offer them? 
find something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 I'm teasing. Well, look, um, you know, I, as I said, I kind of fell into the world of publishing through a friend of mine at the time that was working in the company I, I ended up working at for 20 odd years. And, you know, it's um, it's it's not a career path that most people will actively look for. I mean, you know, media is very broad, as we know. And, and the part that I worked in was to do with with magazines initially, and then magazines and website, you know, the, the digital age started to, to come about. Um, so you kind of fall into these roles. And it, it really comes down to the characteristics. And, and if you are somebody that um, is more positive than, than, than the negative, the optimist, somebody who is it find it comfortable to have, you know, these kind of conversations among, you know, at ease with people, um, open to um, questioning things, mm-hmm. um, finding out more about, you know, what motivates them, what drives them either personally or in business, then you can you can be you can be successful. Um, in in selling and and if you can tie that in with something that you're actually genuinely passionate about as well whether you're selling aircraft or cars or or computers it doesn't matter if that's your thing and you're lucky to have that link together then it becomes a much better uh, a better uh, situation for you Um, but but in terms I, I was joking earlier because you know what I do now I've moved away from the media side and working into the, as you know, from the event side of mm-hmm. things. And, you know, it's it's been a challenging time, Mark. I mean, we've, we we launched this business in the summer of 2019, my colleague Paul and I, uh, with with our great adventure in front of us. And of course, shortly after that, we uh, we had COVID. Yeah, yeah that little thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. We've all struggled. Everyone has struggled yeah. at different levels. And the events and hospitality market has had a very tough time. So we it's oh, been a... Uh, yeah, we decimated to, that whole that whole concept completely well, quite. yeah but i'll tell you if I, if I had that crystal ball and i was sitting around the board table with paul back in the no, 2019 we, we might think differently about what we might have done you know going forward well yeah the crystal ball uh that crystal ball is still pretty foggy right now unfortunately but thing, things <laughs> is, are yeah. improving they are getting better and that's a good sign we're going to take a short break and come back with a bit of a challenge question so keep the seatbelts on we'll be right back What began as a charitable car show has grown into the world's greatest collector car auctions, raising over $133 million for charitable organizations to date. For nearly 50 years, automotive enthusiasts from all over the world have enjoyed the Barrett-Jackson Collector Car Auctions, and I'm a huge fan. Regarded as the barometer of the collector car industry, their auctions are world-class lifestyle events, where thousands of the world's most sought-after unique and valuable automobiles cross the block in front of a global audience, in person, on TV, or streamed online. Barrett-Jackson produces the world's greatest collector car auctions in Scottsdale, Arizona, Palm Beach, Florida, Las Vegas, Nevada, and new for 2021, Houston, Texas. The excitement of Barrett-Jackson auctions is contagious, and a unique experience is not to be missed. And coming soon, something new for you Cars Yeah listeners. I'll be teaming up with Craig Jackson on the first ever Barrett Jackson podcast, coming to your mobile devices every week. Listen here on Cars Yeah and check out the Barrett Jackson website for unique details on this new exciting podcast that I'm very proud to be a part of. And be sure to visit BarrettJackson.com today. Barrett Jackson, the world's greatest collector car auctions. So let's talk about a big challenge, big failure, something that really kind of uh, set you back perhaps, but more importantly, what was that lesson learned so that you can move forward in a positive way? Uh, well, um, let's stick with the positive. Let's look at the challenge that had its its issues to deal with. And and, and I, would, I will go back to uh, a, a topic we've just covered off fairly recently in, in our discussion today to the MotoGP mm-hmm. uh, side of things, because at the time that was a sector it, it, when, when I was there, that was a sector of the market that my particular business group was not operating in. We were very strong in Formula One and all things four wheeled, but we're doing very little in the two wheeled side of motorsport. And However, looking at the audience profiles that we had and how they were digesting the content that we were producing, Formula One certainly was the the, the king. You know, that was by, by a, a company country mile was the most popular content that we were delivering for our audiences and the second most popular we would expect is something like maybe world rally or endurance racing or lamar that kind of thing but actually it was motor gp um and and i said to my my director at the time well you know we're not in this space we're, we're not even here we're not even on the on the map of this particular sport we're a big 
motorsport group we should be we should be doing this and we can use the same blueprint we did for formula one we can go you know we're all feeling very buoyant and very confident and very arrogant maybe because of the position we have we said yeah we'll we'll just make a few calls we'll get some passes and then we'll turn up and everyone will love us and want to work with us like they do everywhere else so we so we got the passes we made the calls we got the tickets we turned up at the at the paddock of my first motor gp race and and nobody had heard of my brand no one and for the first time in my career, I was standing in a feeling very vulnerable and very alone in a business environment, albeit an outdoor environment, where nobody knew who I was or the brand I represented or what we stood for. And it was quite tough because at that point, my job at the time, my my, my objective was to get in to these teams and, and start the networking process and find out what they're looking to achieve and how do I get to meet your partners and what more can we do for you in terms of content and promotion and it was a huge challenge it was a huge challenge and 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 MotoGP as you might know is uh, very st- uh, strongly supported by Italian and Spanish uh, teams mm-hmm. and the audience profiles they're very big in those markets unfortunately i don't speak any italian or spanish so that was another problem i'm used to dealing with international people but i don't have the language skills unfortunately to to make it easier on myself so it was a very very difficult time and something i'd never experienced before because i've always used to turning up and saying hey i'm ben i'm from autosport i'm from f1 racing and they say oh hey ben how are you they know they want want to talk to you because they know the brand but this was the first time in in my and at that point i've been in this that particular industry for about 16 years so it was a it was quite a shock well no kidding. Well, when you look back on that time and how you succeeded through that, worked through that, what's the the lesson learned when somebody listening finds himself in this whole new environment and where they have no presence, no place, and they're wondering, <laughs> what am I doing here? And the other people are saying, why are you here? Yeah, well, it was a, a task of really going back to basics and remembering your fundamentals of mm. how you would sell and present your 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 brand and and, and its values mm-hmm. and and one of the things that i i wanted to do early on to 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 show these people i was talking to that we met, we were serious the way we here to support their motorsport series and we were genuine and authentic i i convinced my i don't know how i did this but i convinced my editor and my publisher to start publishing content on motor gp in the printed product of the magazine now this magazine at the time had been going for 65 years a very established very very much a, a very respected long-serving product they had never ever written about motorcycles at all so for the first time in 65 years here they were writing post race reports um, some articles on some of the teams some of the key riders and then shortly after that i managed to get a front cover with a motor gp bike that had never happened in its in its so history so what was the response of the readers cuz lots of times you'll see this happen with magazines uh, established entities that try to make a shift and all of a sudden the readers go what are you doing <laughs> well it was very positive oh great and good it, it went very well interestingly enough mark what actually happened was the um the sub editor left the brand in disgust <laughs> no so, kidding oh wow he didn't yeah, like change huh? <laughs> he didn't like it at all so we lost a colleague uh, a valuable colleague unfortunately mm. um but the readers welcomed it they they felt it was refreshing they thought it was moving with the times they thought it was listening to the to the passions because they all knew we were still going to do the same thing we're right. still going to write about formula one and endurance racing and poor super cup and rally all that good stuff was still going to go on but this is another element to another string to our bow and they really really welcomed it and because we did that what i was able to do then is take this back to the MotoGP paddock and say, look, this is the proof of how serious we are, guys. We really want to get behind this sport. We're, we're already writing about you. you and go. that really, really resonated very well with these teams. It broke down all the language barriers, all that um, initial sort of cold shoulder activity we were getting. Suddenly they thought these guys, are, they're genuine. They, they really want to get behind it and, and give our sport more voice to a broader audience. And things then started to change for the better. Well, there's a golden nugget that Ben has dropped for us listeners here today. Add another string to your bow. Uh, Mm. Don't be afraid of change. Uh, Try something new and different, especially when you've been doing the same thing for a long time. Uh, You'll never know where it might take you. So awesome story. I love it. Now, Mm. I always ask my guests about a bucket list item. But when you think about this is a new venture for you guys, new Concord. Uh, When you look ahead to this summer and this event, so how would you, what would you like to see the results of this? And obviously this is the first of what you hope are many, many more to come, right? Indeed it is. Yes. 
Uh, so we've already been successful. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've been successful with securing the great content for the event. I mean, one thing that's been really uh, interesting for us to see and, and, and rewarding, welcoming and comforting at the same time is that the, the support from the collectors, the in these very important collectors around the world that have some exceptional cars in their collections, you know, they have bought into this event extremely well. You know, they're bringing very special cars, in many cases, very rare cars. We have uh, over a dozen cars coming to our event, by the way, that are making a Concorde debut. Some of them are coming to a UK Concorde for the first time. You may have seen them perhaps in, in California or maybe in the banks of Lake Como, but you've never seen that car in the UK. Yeah. And there are also several more cars coming that are making a world debut with us. So that fills us at this, and almost like test testament to the the formula that we've created with with Auto Real is, is working for these guys. So we're building the the show. Um, so in terms of what we want to to get out of this in our bucket list, to, to answer your point directly, is I think it's it has to be something that can establish what we hope to become a bit of a legacy. You know, building this this very special event that is absolutely operating at the top end of the tree, um, and is something that can finally draw these very important. Um, highly respected collectors from all over the world to bring their exceptional cars to the UK and show them in a, in a wonderful environment uh, under the under the auspices of, of a competitive concourse. That would be the business goal for me. There you go. Sounds spectacular. Remind listeners, just go to autoroyale.org and you'll find the website. You can see how to attend this event, subscribe, be a part of it, look at all the different aspects of this event, the facets of this beautiful diamond that they're creating here titled Auto Royale. Let's talk about a special vehicle in your life, Ben. Is there one? What is it? And what made it so special? Okay. Well, I would say, well, it's a car I still own. It's, um, I'm not sure whether many of your, um, uh, your listeners will, will, will know the car itself, but it's, it, it's sadly, I, sorry to say, it's not really a, uh, a, a bona fide, uh, classic car, maybe a modern classic, maybe yeah. a sort of a young timer, shall we say. Okay. So, so I have a car. It's a it's a, a Japanese car. It's a Honda. It's it's an Integra, the Type R. Those if any of your listeners oh, yeah. know that, oh, they'll yeah. know. What it's a uh, built built in the from the the nineties. Um, it is still regarded as the um, the best handling front wheel drive car uh, that was available at its time. It, it actually. When you drive the car, it behaves like a real-wheel drive car, but it's a sensational car, an absolute screamer, you know, 9,000 uh, uh, RPM on the rev limit. It's, it's a beautiful car to drive. And that, that for me, that, the car I have is actually heavily modified. I use it for a lot of track days. Um, it's it's borderline a race car, so if I want to become braver and step up into the racing side of things, and it would qualify. It would qualify very comfortably for some historic uh, race car series in the UK. I would need to adjust one or two small things, and I could go racing. But I'm very, very aware of the limits of my talent so I, i'm happy just to do <laughs> track days for fun with my friends and enjoy but the reason why that car is so special for me is i'm i'm a as an enthusiast of course i i'm a big fan and enthusiast for the the nurburgring the nordschleife mm, yeah. circuit in germany i've been going there with a group of friends for sort of 13 14 years now we tend to go two or three times a year and you know if, if you're the kind of guy or girl that sort of loves that challenge we all know the circuit is a huge challenge you are kind of looking to to set your personal best you don't really want to push too hard because let's face it that place is 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 extremely dangerous it'll bite you it will bite you absolutely and i and i i've seen it happen and and you know but it it is a, the ultimate challenge for any driver of any ability that, that wants to to be in that space and the reason why the car is so special for me uh is i have set my fastest lap in that car wow. and um uh because of that reason it's become quite an important car for me because i've i've been there in many different cars over the years and this particular car uh, has allowed me to, to set quite a blistering lap for, for a guy that spends most of his time sitting at a desk well you know that's cool that car has a just a delicious 1.8 liter vtec uh that's engine right. in that thing it does. um yeah it's really wonderful and i love the looks of it because it's like a little almost like a little mini rally car if you will that's in, right in the way it yeah. looks so i think you've picked a great one I've, I've only been able to drive 
uh, on the ring uh, several times. They've been in rental cars. Uh, they've been in okay. E-type e Mercedes Benz. Uh, so kind of a heavy car to throw around, but uh, yeah. certainly a, a fun place to go and, and be a part of. Nowadays, you can't take your rental car in there anymore. They track them with their that's GPS right. and they'll go, uh, uh, right. uh, if you do that, you'll get blacklisted. Uh, yeah, that's right. I, I have to admit, I did return a Mercedes once uh, in Frankfurt that the brakes pretty much were gone. <laughs> that thing, <laughs> I, I had to go up and say, I don't know what's wrong with the brakes, but don't rent this to someone else without checking it first because it doesn't <laughs> stop very well anymore. I don't know what's going on. And kind yeah, of, I tell you, Mark, you still see those cars, the, those rental cars on there when you are there. Um, but what I love about that circuit, apart from the obvious challenge and, uh, and, and the thrill of any petrol head wanting to, to, to go there and, and experience it, is just the, the, the two things, the broad range of cars you see, mm -hmm. you know, anything from a classic. And I've seen guys there in Cobras and, and E-types and C-types. And I've seen guys there in more modern kit like the Ferraris and your Porsches and Corvettes and, and, and those kind of cars and anything in between. So that's always quite exciting for, for a car enthusiast to go to. But moreover, for me personally, is the community of people that are there. You know, you park your car, it doesn't matter what you've got, but you're there. Yeah. And they love that you're there. They love the car you've come in. They want to find out about the car. You know, they might be driving the brand new 911, whatever, and you're driving your Honda Integra of 1996. But they come and talk to you. They, this is great. Tell me about the car. How long have you owned it? What have you done? You've been here before. This is interesting. And that's what I really enjoy about that place is that community of people that just share the same interests, the same passions. And they just love being in those groups, those, those tribes. You're in your tribe. There you go. It's yeah. a tribe. Of, love it. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a wonderful place. I'll tell you two quick stories. My experience there. One was first time I went there. We went into this little shack to buy. Back then it was Deutschmarks. This is before the euro, uh -huh. and right. you would, it was five Deutschmarks per lap. Is I remember, and so I forget how many laps. Probably more than I needed, but I I bought a bunch, and I said. Yeah. I said, okay, here's your tickets. I said, well, don't I need to sign anything? And he goes, you must be from the U.S. He said, no lawyers here. If you crash your car, it's your own fault. <laughs> and uh, and then yeah. the second time I was there, it was sunny at the beginning of the track and snowing oh, on the yes. backside of the cool. track. And yeah, it was like, yeah, yeah. what is going on here? So, That's yeah. Crazy. My top tip for the Nürburgring, and, and forgive me, I, I don't mean to to use the, the, your, this platform to plug anything that shouldn't be plugged. But uh, um, there's a business, there's a, there's a company there called RSR Nurberg. They are, you may have even come across them, Mark, when you were there. They are probably the best race rental company. I've worked with them corporately. We used to run a, um, in my, one of my previous roles. We, we used to do a lot of corporate events and we took a small bunch of clients over to the Nürburgring. We worked with RSR. They did all the tuition. We had the cars with them. It gave my, my clients say, a great experience and insight to this circuit something they probably had on their bucket list all their life yeah and there they were on the nurburgring and then we'd also then that's on the on day two is travel over to spa to the spa francochamp circuit mm. and drive that as well because these guys at rsr operate at both sides so it's the best my top tip is if you want the best experience get these guys involved they're experts absolutely fantastic it is a good way to go i'll make sure to put a link to them on ben shonard's page because if you're going to venture over there they are the ones to don't see them communicate with absolutely i'm going to get in your head a little bit here ben if you were a vehicle manifest as a vehicle what would you be and why oh this is such a tough question to <laughs> ask Mark. it's a tough one because i kind of started off thinking maybe something italian because i've had a lot of italian cars you know the passionate the positive uh, exciting drive but i kind of settled on a C-type Jaguar. Ooh, okay. And why's that? Well, um, I'm British, as you've probably already really? discovered. So, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I thought we'd stick with the British. And and and, and the C-type is, is one of my favorite cars anyway. But I think it's because it's well constructed. It is obviously a car that has achieved it's, it's, it's achieved a lot of things in its time in motor racing of course but it it doesn't pursue the limelight forgive me for saying to anyone that has a c-type sadly i don't but it, it does it lives a bit in the shadow of the e-type but it's happy there it doesn't want to stand out it doesn't want to be the prominent car it just wants to to be modestly proud of what it's achieved and i think that's probably more like me well i like that answer very nicely done and of course the c stands for competition which is a world you've been in and also a <laughs> yeah. world you're in now which is the competition of concourse so i think that's a perfect answer very Thank cool you. yeah are there some ways that you like to give back to others in the automotive world the automotive sector um uh, well pretty more about creating opportunities i think um you know Showing the these specialists, any any brands that I've been working with over the years, it's more about ensuring they understand that I am genuinely interested in what they do. I, I do like to understand 
how these people want to work and how I can help them, you know, whether it's through uh, content or advertising like I did before or now perhaps through live events, meeting uh, uh, and engaging and networking with with potential customers that can, can enrich your your business experiences as well. I think it's, you know, that, that kind of thing, you know, about building relationships the networking, being genuinely interested in what they do. Love it. Now, is there a book that you've read that you'd like to share with our listeners that you uh, glean oh. a lot of info from? Well, uh, not about info, but enjoyment. But I, I've kind of got two. Forgive okay. me, I've got That's two. That's fine. Actually. Love it. And, and one of my, one of my, uh, when I'm not um, getting excited about um, about cars, one of my other big passions is history. And and specifically, I I, I find uh, military history fascinating. And I and I and I read a lot about uh, the Second World War. And um, I read a book recently, which is fascinating. It's called Churchill's Wizards. And it's written by a guy called Nicholas Rankin. And this book, it's a, it's a thick one, so it will take you time to get through. But it kind of comes in two parts. The first chapter is all about the First World War. And the premise is about how camouflage and deception was developed through warfare mm. and how it went from rudimentary um, approaches in the early part of the First World War to very clever, very um, subtle uh, and, and convoluted forms towards the end of that that particular conflict and then the, the second half of the book goes into the second world war where suddenly the whole thing explodes it becomes a complex minefield of elements and and espionage and distraction and coercion and everything in between it's absolutely fascinating and i tell you there are so many times that i had to put this book down because there was many many elements going on and i was my brain was trying to piece these together to understand the complexity of what these incredibly clever people in, in intelligence forces in the armed forces at that time were creating to take an advantage over the over the enemy it's a fascinating book it really yeah, is yeah churchill's wizards the churchill's british wizard. the british genius for deception 1914 1945 fascinating now that's you cool. mentioned a second book yeah, the second book is um, actually a novel. That's the, it's actually a friend of mine. Written, he's, written, he's, a, he's a historian. He writes history books. He had many books self-published on Amazon. But he's published a couple of novels. And this one was his first novel that he sent me a copy of. And, and Julie signed it. So if he becomes famous, it's worth some money to me. Which is always <laughs> nice, isn't it? But it's a book called Silent Crossroads. And the author is a chap called Jem, J-E-M, Daduchu. He's a friend of mine. In fact, we used to work together many, many years ago, and we're, we're very close friends. But this is a book about um, a character called Harry Woods. And Harry is a, a, an Englishman, and he goes to war during the First World War as a British soldier. He gets embroiled in a, a uh, an altercation and a situation during that time, and, and he ends up living in Germany and, and marrying uh, a German woman. And as the outbreak of, of, the, um, of the Second World War approaches, he then joins up with the German forces. So you have this great sort of crossroads of, 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 of life experiences and events on one half the guy who's a British fighting for the British in the First World War but then suddenly fighting for the Germans in World War II and it's a really lovely story uh, about how that they, those two different uh, planes of life can, can you know, come together during this man's uh, lifetime so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great story very cool. New book somebody's never mentioned here before. Jim Duduchu, D-U-D-U-C-U. That's a mouthful. Mm, uh, yeah, uh, a fascinating book. I'll make sure I remind you listeners, you can go to the Cars yeah website and find a whole lot of books listed under guest recommended books. There's over 2,000 books there. I've made it really easy wow. for you to click and buy. You could fill a whole library with all these books. So check it out. We'll take one more last break. We come back, we're going to go on the ultimate drive. So sit tight. I've discovered... Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual, informed, reasoned opinion based on first hand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion. And mine, smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions. Ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. Join Linkage. Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. Hey, if you're lucky enough to be attending the Amelia Island Concours tomorrow and this weekend, be sure to stop by and say hi to two good friends of mine, Lynn Heiner, Lynn Heiner Studios, wonderful artist, painter, 
Uh, you'll love the artwork that she's got there. And Bill Pack from V12 Enterprises, incredible photographer. Say hello to Lynn and Bill for me. Maybe pick up each of their artworks and bring them back as a wonderful souvenir of the wonderful Amelia Island Concours. If you're going to attend, have a wonderful time. All right, I have a magic scepter here at Cars Yeah, Ben, and I can make anything happen. So here's the deal. You get to pick the vehicle you're going to go for the ultimate drive-in. You get to pick the person, living or deceased. Uh, you get to decide who's at the wheel and what are you going to be talking about. So what is your ultimate drive to the English countryside? Uh, okay, well, this may sound, again, a little bit uh, cheesy, shall we say, but I would, I would choose to uh, go on a drive with my late father. Okay. So I lost him about 13 years ago, and we will be driving his and mine favorite favorite car a, a cobra 427 Ooh, okay uh, this is going to be right? little talking and a lot of listening <laughs> <laughs> a lot of noise a lot of wind right yeah. but uh, one of his favorite cars and, and and became one of my favorite cars and i and, and you know if i were in the position to have the um the, the the finances to to get those kind of cars that's first on my list it really is um great car so obviously i would be driving because he's, a, he's an older guy, of course, so I'll, I'll take the wheel. It's a bit of a beast. But really why I selected my, my late father, Mark, is because, you know, he, he died 13 years ago. Mm-hmm. And he um, what, he, he was around when I was working in Formula One in Internet Motorsport. And, and obviously as a fan, he, he, he thoroughly enjoyed the fact, you know, showing off to his chums that his son's working in F1. Yeah. And, and they would often see me on the tent when they have those video um uh, shot to the the presenters doing the, the, the to piece the to camera pieces and I'd often be in the background apparently and then he would ring me and say oh, I've just seen you on TV. That's but nice. His favourite magazine in the entire world was Classic and Sports Car. And shortly after he died, I was then moved on to Classic and Sports Car as uh, as commercial director. Oh, wow. And it would have been great for him to still be around for, to, to 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 have his son move on to his favourite magazine. It was always in the house i remember growing up at home and you know it was always the magazine that was on top of the coffee table wasn't under the coffee table other things like land rover owner and uh, you know classic car enthusiasts and other things but classic and sports car was always the one that had that pride of place it was his favorite magazine and and i spent 11 years as commercial director of that particular brand so he would have really enjoyed that and of course we would have been able to experience more of the classic car world together we would have been able to go to the big events like goodwood and lamar classic and pebble beach together hopefully um he would have loved that but but i think also and again forgive me for indulging this particular question a bit and being a bit uh, soft with it but uh, I, I have two two boys uh, one is 11 one is eight and unfortunately my father never got to meet his grandsons and he would have really loved that he was he would have loved to do that so i'm being a bit soft i do apologize i'm using the question to um to, to, okay. to perhaps win back some time with my father we're both car guys so it's relevant he was a car guy bona fide enthusiast so we'd have loved to have a, a blast in the english countryside with a cobra chatting about all the things he's missed out on the last 13 years it sounds Sounds uh, spectacular, no doubt. He's a very proud person of his son and, okay. and who you are and what you've become and his grandchildren. And I'll tell you, you know, my my late father, I lost him almost, well, about four years ago now, almost to the day. And uh, he got me into cars because his first sports car was a 49 MGTC uh, oh, that I would okay. ride around in the right seat because it was left-hand drive. Yeah, course, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, right-hand drive. I would drive around in the left seat, yeah, so that uh, uh, he would take me. And I remember as a little boy, five, six, seven years old, uh, riding in that car with him. So yeah, Fabulous. great memories. Fantastic. You've taken us on a very wonderful, heartfelt ride here today, Ben, and I can't thank you enough. Before I let you go, though, is there maybe a parting piece of wisdom advice or a success quote or a mantra you'd like to share? Um, not really a mantra or anything like that, but I, I, I think what I would would impart on anyone doing anything is to be genuine and and to and to ensure you give enthusiasm to what you do. One of the things I've always found that makes a difference in anything you do, it could be a work project, it could be uh, skill or anything like that, is just to be enthusiastic. And enthusiasm seems to be something that is enough to capture people's interest and capture their attention. And and in, in the line of work that I'm in, in terms of selling and in commercial partnerships, you know, being enthusiastic for what you do, what you have, what you represent, and importantly, what they're doing as well. It's, it, it's, it goes a long way. And then you find that people want to work with you because you have that energy behind you. That's, that's what I would say. Enthusiasm is contagious, as we say here it's at Cars. Yeah. How can people learn more about this fantastic event, the Concours at Auto Royale? 
uh, visit the website. There you that's go. the best thing to do. I mean, you know, visit the website. Uh, you've already mentioned it in, in, your, in your show already earlier on. So that's the place to go. That will give you all the insight you need on the event. And if you're keen to come and join us, and we'd love to have you with us in the summer, uh, there, there, there's a link through there to the ticketing website, should you be inclined to do so. Absolutely. And you know what? Uh, with as locked up as we've all been, it is time to get out and have some fun and do things you've always dreamed of doing. And this sounds like something very, very cool indeed. I'll put everything on Ben's show notes page. You can find it on the Car Show website. Just type in Ben Guynan, G-U-Y-N-A-N, and you'll find everything there. Again, a big thank you to Paul Mathers, past Car Show guest, for introducing me to Ben to make this very nice talk possible today. Ben, thank you for being so generous today with your time. My pleasure. You're, it's been really, really fun talking with you. Can't wait to uh, hopefully see you at your event. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you at Auto Royale. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.